The last six months have been weird um, for all of us. And we watched this incredible run-up in the price. And it dominated the conversation. Now, if you've been in this space for a while, this isn't new to you. Right? You've seen this happen. This is maybe the sixth, seventh, maybe eighth big bubble-like behavior where you see this massive increase in price. And we've seen it before. I remember at some point in October, I started getting calls from journalists, and they asked me to comment on this. And they would ask in a very kind of cagey way, so what do you think? Could this possibly maybe be a bubble? I was like, of course it's a bubble. <laughs> We're living in the era of the everything bubble. But really, it's not the Bitcoin bubble you should be worried about that everybody is very aware of. I'd be more worried about the subprime auto loan bubble, the stock bubble, the bond bubble, the real estate bubble. The student loan bubble, the debt bubble, the foreign exchange bubble, the fang bubble, the tech bubble, the everything bubble. Yes, Bitcoin is a bubble, the most obvious of the bubbles right now. And 24 hours later, someone made a video with me in a Darth Vader mask. <laughs> said, Andreas went over to the dark side. <laughs> He's calling it a bubble. <laughs> Told you so. All I said was, be careful. And obviously, some people were not careful. Price dominated everything. I think many of you have probably had this experience. You come into this space, you don't know what's going on. It's all very, very weird and complicated and difficult to understand. You find someone who can explain some detail to you, and you start barely understanding some of the things around you. And then you suddenly realize that even though you are quite aware you don't know what the hell is going on in this Bitcoin space, or in the related space, the entire cryptocurrency space, to everyone you know, you're the expert. <laughs> and they come to you and they go, you know about Bitcoin. Should I invest in IOTA? <laughs> or, you know about Bitcoin, is this a good time to get in? And maybe you told them when the price was, I don't know, 200. And they ignored you because they thought it was silly internet money. But the morning that it hits 19,000, they call you up and they go, "Is this a good time to get in?" <laughs> and depending on whether they're a good friend, in which case you say, "Hell no, wait," or they're that douchebag who bullied you in high school. <laughs> In which case, you're like, yeah, now's the time to get in, Chad. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, of course. Everyone in this theater is wonderful. We wouldn't do that. But the best part, after you told them to get in at 200 and they ignored you, and they called you up at 19,000, in January and February, you start getting the calls. I know you've had them where someone calls you up and they go, Are you okay? <laughs> I saw on CNBC that Bitcoin crashed. It's, it's destroyed. It's gone. It's down in the doldrums. It's a mess. Are you okay? Now, let's not minimize the fact that a lot of people who did get in at 19,000, probably in a very ill-advised way, are hurting. And that's not funny. That's 
bad investment decisions, and you should be very, very careful. These things are extremely volatile, but it is extremely ironic when people call you up and they go, are you okay? Because we heard it crashed a year ago. We were just over a thousand. So price-wise, we're up a cool 800 percent. So your answer should probably be, you're in S&P index funds. Are you okay? <laughs> because the day I start hearing about your investment on TV, you won't be okay. Nobody will be okay. And so you see, even my talk here, dominated by price, not something you hear me talk about a lot, but it's apropos, it's the times we're in. And then suddenly, the price tanks, the meetups start getting roomy again. <laughs> the phone calls stop. Some people start laughing at you again. Because they're like, I told you it was crazy magic, magic internet money that would crash. And the cycle repeats. Do you guys like farmers markets? Anybody here like farmers market? If you go to a farmers market this weekend, they're going to have two things. Rhubarb and pumpkins, <laughs> because it's winter, <laughs> and you're not going to find a great array of beautiful organic vegetables. Those come from Mexico at this time of the year. The farmers, the local farmers market, all they can deliver at this time of year is rhubarb. And in a great analogy to the economic situation we're in, if you went to the farmer's market right now and noticed it's not very popular and there aren't too many people there, you might go, huh, farming is dead. I knew it. I saw it on CNBC. Somebody asked me recently at a talk, how do you pay the guy on the street with Bitcoin? Like if a homeless person asks you for a donation, you can't pay them with Bitcoin. So actually I can, actually I have. It takes 15 minutes because I have to teach him how to install a wallet and where to spend it and how to find other people. And so it becomes an exercise of slightly patronizing education, of course. Um, but it's sometimes worth it, and I'll also give them some cash because I'm not a monster. But <laughs> because, by the way, if you decide you're only going to tip or give money to homeless people in Bitcoin, you're a douchebag. I mean, it's really quite simple. <laughs> so you can do that. So my question back to this person was, well, tell me, um, how do you pay the homeless person with a credit card? Because how many of you are actually carrying that much cash that you use for any other purpose other than tipping? We don't. What we've done is we've outsourced our commerce to these intermediaries. And I have a really simple question for you. In this room tonight, how many of you have a point-of-sale merchant system that can accept a credit card? I do. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine out of 380 people. Which means that none of you can take my credit card, which means that none of you can take a payment. You can use intermediaries. You're going to have to stack them all together and make a little pyramid of intermediaries. Well, you know, I can, I can put PayPal here, but PayPal will take it from Visa, and Visa will take it from your Chase bank account. So, so it's Chase, Visa, PayPal, Chase, me. Wait. How did Chase get in there twice? <laughs> Fuck. I should be in that business. They didn't actually do anything. What did they do? They moved bits on the internet. We've been moving bits on the internet for 25 years for free. How did they figure out that this cost 2% of my transaction?
The invention of Bitcoin is about decentralization, because what it does is it removes intermediaries. And if you understand anything about the internet, all of the great things that the internet did come down to one word, disintermediation. I need to put a classified ad in a newspaper to sell my furniture to my neighbor. Oh no, I don't. Bye-bye newspapers. Oops, they're gone. An industry that existed for hundreds of years, now a hollow shell that does infotainment. <laughs> and several other industries, right, have gradually fallen to this powerful effect of disintermediation. And disintermediation is important because it allows you to do two things. It allows you to shorten the distance between buyers and sellers and remove all of the points of friction and control, which means lower cost, it means faster service, and it means a more direct interaction between the person providing the service and the person consuming it, so that we can start behaving like human beings that interact with each other. If I buy something from someone directly, I know who they are. I don't need three intermediaries of trust in between. Not only does this intermediation remove these, but the other insidious problem of intermediaries is control. Because they're not just going to take a cut of everything they do, they're now going to start telling you what you can and cannot sell to whom you can and cannot sell, to which country you can and cannot send money. And that would be wonderful if they shared my moral principles and decided that no, we really shouldn't be sending 40% of our budget to Lockheed Martin and General Fucking Dynamics to bomb people around the world. Maybe we should do something else. But no, they don't have my moral principles or probably your moral principles. They think it's very wrong to send money to WikiLeaks that hasn't been convicted of doing anything wrong ever. But it's perfectly right to send a contribution to the Alabama chapter of the KKK, which is a fundamental problem in all of our platforms today. They have become gatekeepers as intermediaries. So the side effect is not just the 2% cost of every transaction, it's the fundamental erosion of democracy. It's the destruction of all of the other institutions that we used to have control over. We no longer have choice, we no longer have voice. And what is left when you have no choice and no voice? Exit. And we can do exit the hard way. And exit the hard way is trying to get with 50 other people into a tiny boat and cross the Mediterranean, a man-made crisis. But exit the slightly less hard way is saying, I'm opting out. I am leaving your centralized parasitical system, and I am choosing to use decentralized platforms. I'm using decentralized platforms for my money. I'm using decentralized platforms for my payments. But I'm also using decentralized platforms, perhaps in the future, for my speech, for my publishing, for my corporate organization for all of the other interactions that require trust, where trust used to be a function of hierarchy, and it no longer is. Trust is now a protocol. And when we have the technological tools to take trusted institutions and convert them into a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, we take back that control. We remove the intermediaries. We cut off the flows. If you want to stop a parasite, you have to stop feeding it first. And so that's what this is about. That's why decentralization matters. And the problem is that when I talk to audiences in Argentina, or I talk to audiences in Greece, or I talk to audiences in Cyprus, or many other places around the world where they're not part of the 5% population of this planet that has our advantages, they get it. They've already seen it happen two, three times in one generation. They've seen what happens when money fails. They've seen what happens when institutions get corrupted, eroded, and finally destroyed by these parasitic organizations. And these parasitic organizations keep arising because nothing has changed in the fundamental architecture. If the architecture is a pyramid, 
someone will climb to the top. Changing people at the top doesn't change the architecture. Corruption will flow upwards, and they will become corrupt, too. They are just doing their job. I have met plenty of bankers. They are nice people. They are just trying to pay their mortgage. They are debt slaves, too, most of them. Right? They are just contributing to the inevitable, inexorable momentum of a machine that moves in one direction only, without guidance from morality, because it doesn't have morals. It is a corporation. It is not immoral, it is simply amoral. It doesn't have morals. How do we increase our profit margin this week? Well, we could sell facial recognition technology to law enforcement companies. After all, what are they going to do with it? Hey, didn't Oakland PD murder a whole bunch of their own fucking citizens, even though they were unarmed? Yes, but if they violate the Constitution, they'll probably be in violation of our terms of service, so we can shut them down. <laughs> Who the hell do you think you're kidding? Really? And the people who make these decisions they are not evil people, they are just moving inexorably. They have seen that this is a big pipe, a big pipe of money that wants to throw millions and then billions of dollars into facial recognition and surveillance and tasers and pepper spray and drones that bomb you with pepper spray from the sky with tasers. <laughs> and they are like, money! And they stick a straw in it because they are just making decisions on a local context. You cannot stop that by saying, be better, Amazon. Be better people. Don't be evil. What a great slogan. You can't fix it. <laughs> we have to change the fundamental architecture. And the fundamental architecture, the reason this can be done by large corporations is because of centralization. Is because they have taken the convenience of the one-click buy and the convenience of the profile share and all of the little micro violations of privacy, and they have built a massive information cartel that delivers billions of dollars that allows them to centralize and become parasites. They are actually quite benevolent right now. But we know where this is going. This is not going to get better. It is not going to magically resolve our, itself until we change the fundamental architecture. So that's the message. The message of the movie we just watched. The message that Bitcoin brings, and the reason it's so, so strongly resisted, is because it says, we don't need your permission, your regulation isn't working, you can't scale to solve the problems of this planet. Because at a very fundamental level, your architecture is wrong. And the architecture we want is peer-to-peer. -peer. It's flat, it's decentralized, it's end-to-end. -end. It innovates at the edges without permission, and innovations flow up and are part of everybody's experience. That's the architecture we want, peer-to-peer. -peer. That's why it matters, not just in money, in corporate governance, in law, in voting. But first, and most importantly, we have to starve the parasites. And the first thing that needs to be broken is the cartel of money. And the way we do that is by exiting and using peer-to-peer -peer money. This has never happened before. There has never been a financial system that allows everyone in the world access through a simple personal device. The ability to do international co commerce on the scale of a multinational bank for an individual. There has never been a technology like this. And so when people say, I'm scared, I don't know what's going to happen next, I don't understand this, all that tells you, generally speaking, is their age. I'm scared too. I'm getting older and harder for me to absorb change. I find myself struggling to keep up. I read incessantly just to keep up with people who are younger than me, who have more elastic brains, and are easier to change. But the real gap, the real generational gap, is this. Every child born today will never live in a world where cryptocurrencies didn't exist. 
We'll never live in a world before the internet. We'll never live in a world before Bitcoin. We'll never live in a world before individual freedom in commerce. And so, this person who grows up with a system like that doesn't know that it's not always been like that. Doesn't know that it could be any other way. And if you tell a young person money is an internet protocol, which you can transmit freely anywhere in the world, they look at you strangely. They go, well, of course it is. What do you mean? In my days, money was printed on cotton and linseed fabric with green ink. And we kept it in our pockets, and we had to physically meet the other person and hand them this germ-ridden piece of fabric. And it had no value. But the government that had a complete monopoly in issuing it and could issue as much as it wanted told us that it had value. And then one day we just got pieces of plastic that allowed us to do the same transaction, only now it was even more controlled and under totalitarian surveillance at all times. You're crazy, Grandpa. There's no way. That's how money worked. That makes no sense. I can just imagine now, 20 years from now, a young student of economics at university is given a paper, and they have to write about the history of central banking. And they're struggling. Because they can't understand why any people would allow the entire nation's finances to be decided by a group of 12 people who are unelected, and meet every Friday in person, and then announce to the rest of the economy what the interest rate will be. It's mind-blowing. It's almost like looking back and seeing people with wigs, riding horses around, and taking a week to get from one side of the country to the other, if they don't die of cholera on the way there. So imagine that ten-year-old, who is not allowed to have access to a bank account until they are sixteen years old, who cannot buy anything online with a credit card until they are sixteen years old, who has to beg their mom or their dad to give them access to the iTunes card or the Amazon account. Or, as one little ingenious kid I watched, did, who waited until mommy was sleeping and used her thumbprint to buy all of his Christmas presents on Amazon, on her phone. And at that point, if you are the parent, you can't decide if you should be furious or really impressed <laughs> for the sheer ingenuity. But imagine that ten-year-old using cryptocurrencies, trading those cryptocurrencies with their friends. And they're doing that now. And if you're a parent and you have kids those, that age, you don't even know they're doing it. They're doing it. And if you tell them not to, then they'll double do it. They're going to grow up in this environment. They are going to have access to personal, private money that you don't know about, that they trade with their friends, that they use to buy things for themselves. They will establish financial autonomy by the time they are 10 or 12, once they figure out how to use this technology, which they will do about 20 times faster than you, and then they will maybe explain it to you if you are good. And then imagine the scenario where they walk into a bank at 16 years old, and they sit down with a banker. And a banker tells them, you can access your account Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. For the privilege of us holding control over your money, we will charge you $5 a month if you don't maintain sufficient balance. 
on which we will give you an interest rate of 0.01%. You will not be able to exchange it for any other currency. You will only be able to buy things from merchants we approve of, unless there is a currency embargo, or some moralistic crusade against your favorite thing. But don't dare spend a dollar that you don't have in there, because then the interest rate is 25 percent. And at random times, we will shut down your accounts and block your transactions, because one of your transactions had the word Bitcoin in it. And we're terrified old people who don't understand what the fuck that is. <laughs> and that kid will walk out of that bank and go, that's insane. Why would I ever do that? Everything they do, I can do faster, I can do more securely, I can do for less cost, with absolute control. But that's not how it's going to play out. It's not going to happen that way. And the simple reason is that there won't be a bank for that kid to walk into. Because the fundamental function of storing your assets for you will not exist in a couple of decades. It cannot exist because it is unnecessary, because it is expensive, most importantly, because it is oppressive to those who can have it, and it is denied from the vast majority of the people on this planet. And they will simply make the choice to do without. Will there be people who have bank accounts? Absolutely. Does anyone in this audience own a horse? Have you ever ridden a horse? Yeah, a couple of people. Fantastic. It's not your primary means of transportation. It's a hobby. Maybe. Maybe it is your primary means of transportation, but for most people it isn't. Right? If daddy buys you a pony, you're a princess. hundred years ago, if daddy bought you a pony, you were supposed to ride that to the farm and work. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is that these technologies won't eradicate banking, they'll simply make it the obscure, weird hobby of a few curmudgeonly diehards who like to still do things the old way. Every now and then, I walk into a supermarket and I'm waiting patiently to do my shopping, and someone in the front of the line pulls out a checkbook. And twenty people in the line go, Ugh. <laughs> that person will never use a credit card. And neither will your children. Because it will be just as ridiculous as obsolete as taking a steam engine, riding a horse, driving your own car, using cash or a credit card, or more importantly, using a bank. But one of the reasons Bitcoin was created, and one of the reasons it's important, is because it is neutral, because it is independent, because no one can control it because no one can change its issuance, because no one can create it out of thin air. It's ironic that when you see criticism of Bitcoin by mainstream economists, they say things like, it's not backed by anything. <laughs> and really, the question you should be asking at that point, and the dollar is? Of course, the dollar is backed. But you really don't want to hear that story <laughs> as to what it's backed by. Because then you have to learn some history about Henry Kissinger and the Saudis and the little deal made in 1971. 
some towers fell, some nasty things happened, and we've been at war for 18 years. But anyway, the dollar is backed by something. War. To protect oil. And Bitcoin is backed by an international community of geeks. The same geeks who brought you the internet. So again, at some point, hopefully you never have to make this choice in your life, because you can always have the freedom to choose one currency versus another. But at some point, you might be forced to choose between the bankers who brought you the Great Depression and the geeks who brought you the internet. And I hope you make the right choice. <laughs> but then again, if you hear some of the people in the whole blockchain, cryptocurrency, bitcoin space talk, you might think that the goal of all of this is to eradicate government money as the first step towards eradicating government altogether and replacing all currencies with bitcoin one coin to rule them all world domination um i'm not of that opinion in fact i think the idea of having only one world currency is a bit of a throwback to our current currency system. We've grown up with a system of currency where all currencies are backed by nation-states. They represent flags. Right? They have wrapped up in the commercial mechanism of value a bit of nationalism and patriotism and a flag-waving person. And in each country, it's a different flag. You know, they can all do their little chant. By the way, if you go to other countries, when they wave their flag, they also chant number one. <laughs> it's a bit like when you ask people, are you a good driver? And they say, yeah, definitely. And then 80% of people say they're an above average driver. <laughs> How does the math on that work? So we have become accustomed to a world in which currencies represent nations and therefore they're part of this battle. It's like the world is a big chessboard and currencies are pawns that are fighting on this big geopolitical battle. And the dollar wins if the ruble fails. It's country versus country. And in that environment it's natural to think that currency as a system is a winner-takes-all system, or a zero-sum game, where the only way that one currency wins is by another currency losing. And that's a world in which you cut off your nose to spite your face, which is a good summary of our current foreign policy, but also a good summary of the foreign policy of the European Union, China and Russia. <laughs> we are currently engaged in currency wars, and in those currency wars, we are expected to assume that our currency, which represents our flag, is the one we should be backing. But if you stop and think about that for a second, you suddenly realize that that's not money anymore. That token is no longer representing a commercial transaction. It's not representing value for use in business. It's representing something else. It's representing some kind of nationalistic flag-waving thing that you're trying to beat the other side with. And in that environment, if that's what you know, if that's what you grew up with, then when something like Bitcoin comes along, your natural inclination is to think, "Oh, this one could win the zero-sum game. This one could dominate all the others." But what if that's not how it plays out? What if instead, all along, money was simply a form of language? What if we understood that money is a way for us to communicate value to each other? And as a language, there can never be one that wins. There will always be variety, because every place has its tradition and its special needs. We have languages 
like those of the Inuit that have eight words for snow. They don't need that in the Kalahari Desert. So they're going to have a different language that has 20 words for sand, <laughs> which they don't need in Alaska. <laughs> but the bottom line is that languages adapt to the local environment, and they will always keep proliferating. And there isn't one wins. In fact, if you speak three languages or four languages, you're better off than if you just speak one. So, in fact, having variety is what gives you greater value. What if money works that way? What if, in fact, we're going from a world with 195 currencies to a world with 1,000 currencies, to a world with 10,000 currencies, 100,000 currencies? And you can use as many of them as you want or not, and you can choose at any moment in time. And then it, when you hear that, you probably think, well, that sounds very fucking confusing. <laughs> I don't want a thousand currencies. I can barely keep track of how many euros are in a dollar when I go on vacation to Disneyland in Paris. Well, the good news is that we're not talking about traditional paper money, we're talking about purely electronic money. And all of the world's currencies are going to purely electronic money. At which point, the difficulty of trying to figure out which currency you have, which currency the shop will take, what the exchange rate is, and how to convert them, is something that disappears into your smartphone, or your iPad, or your smartwatch, or whatever other device is holding your money. And then, the fact that you have ten currencies really isn't an issue, because you don't even know you have ten different currencies. What if we're going to a world where fully connected, Instantaneous commerce is possible by anyone, anywhere, and they don't even need to commit to a specific currency. And no currency wins, because we all win by having choice. And that's really what it boils down to. Until now, you get to use the currency of the country you were born in, and you don't have a choice. If you're an American, you also have the choice to use other currencies, but in many countries in the world you don't. Just one. And you still have to use that one to pay for government services and pay your taxes and things like that. And you still have to play the games of geopolitics because your retirement and your education fund and your health care and your job and your income and all of your expenses are denominated in the currency that they're using as a weapon. Not that you wanted to be playing in those games, but you get to. What does that look like? It looks like waking up in the morning and deciding to go to the supermarket early because you know that at noon they change the prices every day. And eggs could be 30% more expensive later in the afternoon. That's what it looks like. And I've seen that in Greece, and they're experiencing that in Venezuela and Turkey today. So when you understand that Bitcoin happened in 2009, you might think, well, why? Who needs it? What are we going to do with this? Is it just about beating the dollar and having a new thing that wins everything? It's not. It's about having a choice. And for most of the people in this country, that choice isn't very important. But for the rest of the world, that choice is absolutely critical. Most people live under horrible governments that do not give them the freedom to transact with anybody. But they also don't give them the freedom to escape from whatever crazy war, attrition, trade war, currency war they are playing at the moment. Most people live in countries where it is impossible to distinguish between organized crime and organized banking. Although, to tell you the truth, the customer service from the black market organized criminal who changed my money in Argentina was a hell of a lot better than the bank of Argentina where I tried to change it earlier. 
So maybe there is a way to tell the difference between organized crime and organized banking. Both are criminals. Some of them give better customer service. <laughs> but if you live in a country like that, and suddenly something like Bitcoin comes into the world, not quite yet, because it's difficult to use, and not many people have the tools and the skills to use it, but one day soon, for many people, and already for some people, you suddenly have a choice. You can say, you know what? You go play your games, Mr. Erdogan. You want to try and play Russia against America? <laughs> In a currency and trade war, fighting over F-35s and S-400s, if you know what I'm talking about? Great! While you take the lira to trash, I'm going to take just a bit of my wealth and move it into Bitcoin. And no one can stop me, because this is an internet currency that doesn't pay attention to borders. And if you live in Venezuela and your government is in a death spiral, you can say, I'm going to take some of my money and I'm going to convert it to Bitcoin, or have someone send me Bitcoin from another country. And I'm going to be able to provide food for my children. And I'm going to be called a terrorist by my own government. And I'm going to break the law. And my children are going to get fed. We know of people who actually bought food on Amazon Prime, had it shipped to Colombia and smuggled into Venezuela using Bitcoin. Food. This technology gives people choice. And we already have more than a thousand currencies that are trying to find different ways to use that same basic technology to do different things. It's a very exciting technical space which has erupted over the past ten years and created this enormous diverse environment with a lot of exciting development going on. And at the same time, it is a giant speculative bubble with a lot of greedy people running around in circles, screaming, trying to get rich. And at the same time, it is an enormously powerful international movement for freedom and choice that can change the lives of billions. Thank you. There are two completely different sides to the security industry. There are the insiders, and then there's everybody else. So you'll go to these conferences and you'll hear a lot of conversations about quantum computing, right? Or how people might brute force one day and reverse elliptic curve cryptography. We'll talk about vulnerabilities in hardware wallets, the difficulty of generating good entropy in a system. The challenges of operating system security and creating trusted boot stacks that we can verify, running trusted code. And what does that mean to the average end user of cryptocurrency? Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't mean anything. It's a foreign language. It's completely irrelevant. This is the fundamental challenge, because if you hear all of these talks, you'd think that the vast majority of theft of cryptocurrencies or loss of cryptocurrencies happens in some mad scientist lab where quantum computers are crunching away to break 128-bit security or reverse elliptic curve. When usually it's someone running Windows, who's downloaded 17 toolbars, one of which is a Trojan, and then decides to use that to run a Bitcoin wallet. Or it's someone who put their money on a custodial exchange that they first heard of in a Google search they did yesterday, and it offered them great trading opportunities. Of course it did. It's missing only one feature, which is the ability to withdraw. And then one day it's not there anymore. <laughs> the vast majority of loss in this industry happens because of very, very, very simple problems. Fishing of your SIM card. 
why would an attacker try to build a quantum computer to reverse elliptic curve when they can hack a $12 an hour minimum wage call center Verizon employee to hand them over your SMS two-factor by porting your SIM card? And if you are actually using SMS two-factor, compared to the vast majority of people out there, you are already on the cutting edge of OPSEC. <laughs> Two factors? That's a whole other factor on top of the one I already had, which was password 1234. You're cruising out there in OPSEC wonderland. And then suddenly it's all gone, and you have no idea what you did wrong. What could you do better? So for the average user, we have this incredible conundrum. One of my hobbies is a pilot. I fly small planes. And one of the things I love about it is reading about accidents and trying to understand the risk factors in aviation. You have to know what kills pilots in order to not be one of them. So I read all of these obscure reports about failures and maintenance and complex systems. And the vast majority of problems are decision. Decision fatigue, lack of situational awareness, cascade problems. That's what causes accidents. Here's what happens if you put a stack of these reports in front of the average person. They're going to decide not to fly. And instead, they're going to rent a car and drive from Pensacola to New Jersey. Forget the fact that driving is approximately 10,000 times more dangerous. Forget the fact that more than 100,000 people die on the streets every year because of car accidents. That's the naive risk assessment. I understand how to drive a car. I have no idea how that thing remains airborne. I don't know how they maintain it. I don't understand any of the risk factors. And reading these reports, it sounds like a death trap, so I'm going to jump into my Camry and drive to New Jersey. And even that sense of control, I'm in control. I'm behind the wheel. Sure. I have to dodge three texting teenagers per mile, two drunks, a sleepy truck driver, and dead animals over the road, but at least I'm in control. And that fundamental risk miscalculation kills people. The death rate in the United States quadrupled on the roads in the few weeks after 9-11 because people stopped flying. I got on a plane the week after. We do that in crypto. We do that every day in crypto. People read about an obscure vulnerability in the bootloader of a Trezor hardware wallet and decide, well, that's it. I'm not using any of that shit. I'm going to build my own solution which will be a BIP38 paper wallet that I load on a Raspberry Pi. I've never used any of those things before. Step one, download a secure operating system and install it in complete isolation from the internet. How the hell do I do that? I've already failed at step one. And I have no idea how to actually securely verify that what I downloaded is real. And then I don't know how to use it. And not knowing how to use it is like driving from Pensacola to New Jersey in order to avoid the risk of a flight. This is the exact risk calculation that happens. Because the greatest enemy to security on the front end where users are operating is complexity. It's not the obscure vulnerability found in one system. It's not the possibility of Russian agents doing quantum computing. It's the fact that you're going to forget the complex password that you put on your system and lose all of your coins. It's that you 
decide to install your own wallet and take control of your money, and then you screenshot the seed and upload it to Dropbox. Because why wouldn't you? That seems kind of secure. Dropbox has a password. We laugh at this. Security experts will look at that and go, Dunning-Kruger effect. Idiots don't know what they don't know. That's the uncharitable way to put it. If you read on the internet, Dunning-Kruger comes up a lot of the time, people mocking other people for not knowing the extent of their own ignorance. If you actually read the study, you figure out that we all have Dunning-Kruger. It's just sectional, right? So, I know security, and I'm fairly confident about that, but on the dance floor, I think I'm a great dancer because there's no mirrors for me to see what it looks like from the other side. And that's Dunning-Kruger in action. I don't know how bad it is, because I am spared that knowledge, fortunately. We all have domains in which we think we know, but don't, and our ignorance of what we don't know makes us cocky, and we take risks, risks we don't even understand, because we don't have enough knowledge to evaluate these risks. We all suffer from Dunning-Kruger. In security, however, it's fatal. In security, it's what's going to cost you your funds. You don't know the risks you can't evaluate. And then you make poor risk choices, because you watch something on YouTube and miscalculate it. Let me give you a classic example. I've been trying to debunk this now probably for two years. People who create a mnemonic seed and are so worried that someone is going to break into their house in a cat burglar suit in the middle of the night, steal their seed, and swipe their money. They don't apply the actually prescribed solution, which is a secondary passphrase to that seed. Instead, they improvise. They take their 24 words, they cut them into four pieces, they store each of the pieces in four different locations, and they feel secure. They've just taken 256-bit security and reduced it to 64 bits per piece. And if you think 64-bit security is one quarter of 256 bits, that's done in Kruger right there. <laughs> it's not. It's 10 to the 50 less secure. That's 10 with 50 zeros after it, less secure than if you had to crack the whole thing. So if I manage to get three of those pieces, cracking the last one, <laughs> doable. In fact, the 64 bits of security of that one piece that I need in order to break your seed is less than a good passphrase that you could have put on. And there's no password stretching, so it's going to be a lot easier for me to crack it. But that's not the real problem. The real problem isn't the fact that you don't understand exponents or complexity. And you thought, if I just cut it in four pieces, it's four times more secure. The problem is that you just created a solution that isn't resilient. Because that is a four of four system. You need all four pieces reconstructed in perfect order in order to get your seed back. You lose one word on one of those pieces, you're in trouble and need some help. If you lose one of those pieces, good luck finding someone to help you crack it without stealing it. If you lose two, you're done. So you don't realize the risk you've actually exposed yourself to, which is loss, in order to protect a risk that really you weren't facing, which is the mystical cat burglar who figures out that you are a Bitcoin fulfillionaire and comes and steals your seed. You can solve that problem a hell of a lot easier by renting a safe deposit box. The average user is not good at doing that kind of risk assessment, at understanding which risks matter and which risks don't, at balancing safety with resilience. 
at making sure that the elaborate DIY crypto scheme they created can be deciphered by someone else, for example, their heirs, so that if something happens to them, they'll be able to maybe get some of that fantastical inheritance. Your crypto is going to the moon, but your chances of actually making it there over the next 20 years can be rudely interrupted by a bus. And then what? Then your relatives are trying to decipher what kind of mystical cryptography scheme you devised in order to protect your funds. Even if you don't, and all they have to do is figure out what a BIP39 seed is, their biggest problem is that the greatest crypto expert they knew just died. <laughs> so what are they going to do now? You were the expert. They're going to go on Reddit and look for a Sherpa. God help them. People are going to line up to defraud them. So that's the one problem. Security in this space is complex. It's very difficult to understand what the risks are and how to balance them. But worse, the user interfaces are so complex that they're very difficult to apply. A user interface needs to be intuitive, but not just intuitive, intuitively secure. Meaning, when you look at a user interface, there is an obvious thing to do. You better make sure that obvious thing to do is actually the secure thing. If we design interfaces where the obvious thing is the most secure thing, then our users can actually do operational security. If you leave them hanging and they have to figure it out themselves, then we failed our users. And this isn't just a problem of how do I be my own bank and control my own crypto. The vast majority of people faced with this choice, what do they do? They go to a custodial service. They put all their crypto in a bank. It's a crypto bank, still a bank. And they put their money on a custodial service that has far less standards for security than a bank. No auditing, no transparency, no controls, or very few controls. So there are some good ones now. But how long does that last? You know, the saying goes, there are two types of crypto exchanges, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. There is no unhackable exchange. In fact, if you really understand how financial services work, there is no more difficult task today than securing a centralized honeypot of bearer digital assets that can be transmitted irreversibly and disappear. This is a hugely difficult problem. You need a lot of security experts to figure out how to make sure that no one within your exchange can steal it, that it can't be seized, that it can't be accidentally lost, balancing resilience and security, access for your users, and all of those things. It's a monstrously hard problem. If a bank has its money transferred out by wire transfer, they just reverse the wire transfer. If an exchange gets hacked and the money is gone, it's gone. Digital assets are very, very difficult to hold. The only reason they can be secure is if we decentralize control. If thousands of people, then hundreds of thousands of people, then millions of people each hold their own keys, the only reason that's secure is because you have to compromise millions of different people. If you take these millions of keys, and you concentrate these millions of holdings in one custodial institution, that institution, by simple math, has to be a million times more secure than each of the individuals, because they have a million times bigger pot of money, of easily transferable, irreversible, bearer digital assets. And here's the problem we have in security. There is no million times better security. It doesn't exist. You can't do that. So effectively, when you concentrate these many holdings, the level of security decreased. And it didn't decrease a bit. It decreased by orders of magnitude. And that's not the real problem even. The real problem is, what the hell is the point 
if all of the people who use this system are going to use custodial exchanges and custodial wallets. What the hell are we doing this for? Now, a lot of people will smile and say, we want to offer security to our users. We will give them ease of use and peace of mind. What they're trying to say really is, I hear your anarchist ideas about disrupting the banking system, but rather than doing that, how about we replace the old bankers with me? Same business as usual, new faces on the letterhead. The banking cartel sucks, but my new banking cartel will be awesome, because it has blockchain in it. That doesn't change anything. Either we're doing this because decentralization matters, because decentralization is a fundamental principle, because it's a fundamental architecture that our society needs in order to scale without losing all of our freedoms. Either we understand that decentralization is the only thing that will allow us to scale governance, scale trust, scale society, without descending into some kind of totalitarian surveillance nightmare, or we didn't really believe in any of that. And it's just about being the new rich people in charge, replacing the old rich people in charge. We have to solve these security problems because for our users, the two choices are both terrible. Be your own bank without understanding any of the responsibility that has, the complexity that it brings on immature user interfaces with underdeveloped processes, no services and support in a wild west kind of thing. I love that. I'm a geek. I love all of that. I want to take all of the control, and I just enjoy trying to figure that stuff out. But that's not what everybody else is going to do. And it's either that choice, or I can't do this. I'm just going to give my money to someone else who I'm going to trust. And we're back to business as usual. I don't care what you build, build something. Make something better. And if you're not a developer, Help. Send a help desk request. Fix a minor documentation problem. Create a video. Paint a painting. Do a poster. Get up in front of your local meetup and describe your experience so that others can be helped. Everyone has a role to play, and that's what community is about. Everybody thinks the cryptocurrency market just died in January. They look at the empty field, and they think nothing is happening. And yet, that field is planted. And we're waiting for one good rain and a few days of sunshine. And we're going to do this all over again, and it's going to be even crazier the next time. And we'll be better prepared, with better applications, better education, better technology, and stronger community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.